So now I'm going to uh, go to Ashish Jha. Ashish Jha is um, the uh, a pr pr professor of global health at the Harvard uh, T.C. Chan School of Public Health. He's also director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. He is a graduate of Columbia, uh, Harvard Medical School, and also um, uh, the, the, the Harvard T.C. Chan uh, School of Public Health. And you may have seen him many times uh, recently on television. He will be in September the new dean of the Public Health School of Public Health at Brown University. So Dr. Jha, thank you very much for coming uh, today. Thank you for having me on. So um, if you were gonna design the worst possible way to handle a pandemic, pandemic could you have designed a, a better uh, or worse way than what we were doing? Is this the worst possible handling you've ever seen? Um, th th there are features that certainly um, make it among the worst in the world. I'm gonna say that uh, it is possible to have done it worse, but not much worse. Uh, I, I think it's a reasonable argument that we are, have the worst performance of any major country in the world. Uh, and our uh, performance looks like that of Brazil and, and Russia and, and maybe India. So uh, we really are doing uh, quite a bad job. I, I guess maybe the one silver lining of uh, having no national strategy and letting every state figure it out for themselves is a few states are doing a good job. And so uh, that's the one silver lining in all of this. But at the end of the day, it'd be much better if we acted as a country. So whoever the next president is, the same question I asked Mark, if that next president said, okay, I wanna start all over again, January 20th, forget what happened in the past, what would you say to the next president we should do at this point? Yeah, so I, I have similar answers to Mark. Uh, really what we need is a national strategy um, uh, on testing. Uh, so look, there are three or four elements of this, David, that if we just got right, and we have the science for this, uh, we could make a dramatic difference. So what are those three or four elements? Well, we have to have quick, uh, widely available ubiquitous testing. I mean, just the fact that our country with our economic uh, capacity can't test people for an infectious disease, uh, in my mind, is an embarrassment. So we've got to fix that, and there are lots of ways of fixing that. Um, we've got to make sure that our hospitals and our healthcare workers are well stocked with protective equipment. Uh, we've got to have a national mask law, or if we have to do it at the state level, every state needs to pass one. Uh, we have to make some sacrifices during this pandemic. I just think we probably can't afford gyms and bars and a few other indoor gatherings, and we have to be able to do the kinds of things that allow our economy to open up safely. If we did these four or five things, um, we could get 80% of our lives back, not 100, um, and have our economy and have very few people dying. But it feels to me like for a large chunk of the country, we want 100% back and we're going to end up with 30. And that's the problem, is that we, that we just have not been able to mentally wrap our brains around the fact that we're in a pandemic. Now, what about a second wave, so-called? Dr. Fauci talked about it. Are we in a second wave in the South, or is that the first wave? <sighs> I see it as the first wave. And in some ways people start asking, well, you know, is that even such a great analogy? I, the way I see it is we have the South right now sort of neck deep in water. We have chunks, of other chunks of the country that sort of waist deep. And then there are some places in the country that are kind of ankle deep. The, the reason why a wave may still be a useful thing to think about is that in the fall and winter, certainly in large parts of the country where people end up spending more time indoors, I expect the number of cases to start rising. And we have to have a strategy that says, if weather forces us indoors and number of cases start going up, what are we gonna do? That in some ways you could argue will be the second wave, but we're so still in the first in many ways. Why is it out better, better to be outdoors? In other words, the virus doesn't communicate uh, to, from people to people outdoors as well? You know, this is one where we've really learned a lot and the evidence now is overwhelming that most of the transmission happens indoors. It happens when large numbers of people can be as, you know, as few as five or 10, gather for extended periods of time and when they're not wearing masks. That's the perfect setup for the virus transmitting. So, you know, we've even seen data coming out of those mass protests, the Black Lives Matters protests. They have not fueled very many cases. I was worried that they would. They have not. We don't know why. It just seems that the virus is far less stable outside in warm weather uh, and in, in outdoor space. It may be about the airflow. There's a lot of potential explanations, but that's where the data really is coming in. Now, uh, you know, you can always look back and say people should have done something differently. But should the Chinese have done something differently than they did? And had they done so, would we be better off or would it have made a difference? Uh, so absolutely, the Chinese should have done things differently. The single biggest thing is that they should not have tried to suppress 
the information about the outbreak of the virus. Uh, we still have, it's a lot of it is still murky in our heads of exactly what happened, but my best guess is that the virus started circulating in Wuhan probably in November, maybe as early as October, uh, but certainly for much of November and all of December, they really suppressed it. Um, but what happened during that time is there was travel outside of Wuhan. So people infected large parts of, of China and then people left Wuhan, traveled to Europe, traveled to the US and started infecting uh, people in these other countries. So if the Chinese government had been open and transparent, uh, we all could have gotten a much earlier jump. Whether it would have made a difference for the United States is harder to know because we had such clear denial about the virus for all of January and February that if we had known in December, would we have acted more aggressively? I don't know. I, I, it's an honest I don't know, but the world would have been better off at the time. As a scientist, do you have any doubt that this happened by accident from, let's say, a, a wet market? Or did some, uh, somebody create this by humans? Uh, could a human have done this? I have no doubt. I think all of the evidence, all of the data I have seen says to me that this is a natural jump from, is it bats? Is it one of the other, some other animal? We don't know for sure, probably bats, uh, but I'm, I'm, I am pretty sure based on everything I have seen uh, that it was a natural jump, not a man-made one. So how is this really different than the 1918 uh, so-called Spanish flu, which wasn't really Spanish? Um, how, um, what are we doing better than they did then? And do you think that at that time, I think almost 870,000 Americans died, something like that. We now have 150,000. What do you think is the total we're going to get to? And how, again, how do you contrast this with that flu? Yeah. How many we get to is, is an honest, hard question to answer. It depends so much on our behavior over the next uh, six to nine months. Uh, but if you force me to guess a number, I would say sort of 250 to 300,000 deaths, um, maybe more is, is what I expect. Um, the ways in which it is different, first and foremost, is we obviously know so much more about this disease and we're gonna have a vaccine reasonably soon. They did not ever develop a vaccine for uh, the, the uh, pandemic influenza. Um, the other part is, you know, 875,000 Americans, 30 to 50 million people in the world. Those are massive numbers if you think about how much smaller the population was. Uh, America's population was a fraction of what it is today. So that would be the equivalent of many millions of Americans dying today. I do think we'll end up doing better, partly because we've had a bit more of a, uh, a robust policy response, at least in many parts of the country. And I do think we'll be able to bring the pandemic to a close. And I agree with uh, Mark's timing around vaccines. I expect next spring to summer, most of us uh, will have had access to a vaccine that's re reasonably safe and effective. Now, you are currently at Harvard, and the policy at Harvard um, is that a lot of the education in the fall will be on in class. Brown, by contrast, is bringing students back, and I think they were going to have uh, in classroom settings. So uh, is the Brown policy better, the Harvard policy better? Um, who do you want to upset the most, uh, Harvard or Brown, by giving the answer to that question? Well, I've been in favor of the Brown policy and have uh, advocated to President Paxson uh, that we ought to try this. And I think we have to be very clear-eyed that it is going to be hard. Uh, it is, uh, despite best efforts, may not work. Uh, so anyone who wants a guarantee that Brown University and other universities that are trying this will be open all the way through December, there are no guarantees here. Uh, but I believe that we have to give it a shot and we have to give it a shot smartly. And so there's a whole plan that goes into how do you open up a school in the middle of a pandemic. And I'll tell you, plenty of public health experts uh, have looked at me and said, you're crazy, I wouldn't even try. So uh, I am sympathetic to the decision that Harvard made, uh, but my pitch to my uh, boss coming up in a month has been, uh, we should try it. We should be very clear-eyed. We should give it our best shot. And if it looks like it's not working, we should, um, we should okay. accept defeat and move on. You didn't leave Harvard because you didn't like their policy and you liked the Brown policy better. That wasn't the reason you left, right? No. Okay. So um, you are by training an internist for, I am. so can I get some free medical advice? Absolutely. Um, all right. So am I better off to worry that I'm going to die from an infectious disease or some a chronic disease like uh, cardiovascular, what's the greatest likelihood that something's gonna kill me? Which of those, infectious disease or cardiovascular or something like that? Well, so David, um, I, I, th I think in the next year, there is a reasonable uh, risk of uh, people uh, dying of COVID. So I think that remains 
a, a real concern. And if you look at it at a, at a population level, uh, it depends a lot on where you live, but, but there is absolutely. So parts of Florida, for instance, right now, uh, if you are an older person, your risk of dying of COVID uh, really begins to rival your disc, risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. Uh, over the long run, I do hope that COVID is something we'll be able to get our arms around by early uh, next year, at which point your risk of dying from infectious disease does diminish substantially. And then right. it really is much more. Uh, the chronic. best way to live to be 90 is to have good genes, uh, exercise a lot, eat healthy, or pray a lot. What would you say it is? I would say the best way to live to 90, assuming that you can't do manipulation of your genes and you can't pick which, who, you know, who your parents were, um, is to be physically active, to have a broad social network of uh, friends and family. I think that makes an enormous difference. Um, I do think eating healthy matters, of course. Uh, but if I had to pick uh, two things, let's say, I would say uh, be physically active uh, and be socially engaged. All right, so you're in charge of global health at the Institute there, and you're gonna be doing this at Brown. So what do you do to stay healthy? Do you run 20 miles a day? Do you eat only vegan foods? What do you do? Yeah. Uh, um, you right, can't afford so, to be sick because of who you are, right? Yeah, uh, this is you know, the classic, like, are you, are you practicing what you're preaching? Um, I will say the last three, four months have been a challenge. Uh, in the pandemic, a lot of my routines have gotten, uh, have gotten disrupted and I, uh, have uh, in the last few weeks, I uh, realized I need to get that back in, uh, back on uh, shape. But largely what I have done is try to be really physically active. And, and that is, I don't run 20 miles, but I, I go for long walks with my family. I have, we got a dog about a year ago. So uh, long walks with the dog. I, my general feeling about exercise is that the best kind of exercise is whatever fits into your life and, and fits into your life comfortably that you're willing to do on an ongoing basis. For me, it's been largely hiking, walking, Okay. Um, getting out with the family. And you recommend uh, everybody take a statin? Uh, I don't know that everybody needs to take one. As, as people get older, there's certainly very strong benefits of, of people who have either risk factors or elevated cholesterol. Uh, I'm 49. I don't take one. Uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future I might need to take one. But you know, I, I wouldn't put it in the water. What about aspirin every day? You take one of those? Is that good for you? I, I don't, um, but you know, part of it is my own cardiovascular risk is relatively low. Uh, but certainly if I develop some more risk factors uh, or as I get older and, and my risk factor, you know, my kind of risk gets higher, then at that point, uh, aspirin does start to really make sense. And is alcohol good for you or bad for you? So I'm a believer in alcohol in moderation. Um, what is moderation is, is somewhat debated. There's some data that any amount of alcohol is bad. I, I, I maybe it's um, motivated reasoning on my part, but I try to uh, ignore that data. And I believe uh, that for men, a one to two drinks a night, four to five nights a week at the most is probably fine, much above that. And the harms clearly start outweighing the risks uh, of the benefits. Uh, for women, maybe a little bit less than that, just uh, so from uh, consumption. Leave COVID aside for a moment. The two greatest health uh, challenges in the United States seem to be obesity and uh, opioid uh, addiction. So on obesity, why are people so fat in the United States and overweight? Um, is it low fat food they're eating or is it drinking a lot of Diet Coke? What is, it, what is the reason that their people are so fat compared to 25 or 30 years ago? Yeah, um, this is a very good question. And I would say a, a couple of things that we know and then a lot we don't know. There is a lot we don't understand about why there's been such a rise in obesity. Uh, there's no question that people are less physically active than they were. Uh, I think that's a combination of the kind of work people do, uh, the amount of weight that people commute, et cetera. And there's also a lot around diet that I think we're still learning about. America's diet has changed quite a bit uh, as fast food and other kinds of foods have become cheaper and more ubiquitous. Uh, I think those have really contributed. Uh, there's, again, as I said, there's a lot around kind of environmental, social interactions. Some of the most interesting studies out there show that when people become obese, their social network becomes more obese. And so there's just sort of these very interesting social effects that go on that I think we have not fully un uh, untangled. But that said, it still comes down in large part to diet and uh, physical activity. And, and okay, in terms of opioids, uh, are we making any progress there? Is life expectancy in the United States is going down because of opioids, I thought. Yeah, no, we had two years in a row, maybe three of, of declining life expectancy. And then finally a year where it got flat. Um, opioids obviously were the health crisis that the nation was was focused on 
uh, until COVID hit. Um, I'm worried about what's going to come out of this COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, it has really gotten buried, what is happening with the opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, but I think as we emerge from this, we're going to see probably a spike in cases uh, of opioid use and, and misuse. There have been some policy changes that I think are going to be helpful, uh, but I'm really worried that a year from now, we're going to be talking about opioids a lot more than we have been in the, in the past six months. Now, President uh, Nixon declared war on cancer some 50 or 60 years ago, more than that now, I guess. Um, is there any evidence that we actually are making progress on cancer? There is. Um, cancer mortality has come down uh, in the last uh, year or two, uh, but it has taken a lot of effort and a lot of time, and the, and the gains are small when you look at cancer more broadly. But cancer isn't a single disease. And what we're learning over time is that it's not even site specific. So we used to think of, well, there's lung cancer and breast cancer. That's true. But it's, we're really learning that it's about underlying mutations and genetics. So I, while the overall progress on cancer has been modest, I look out to the next 10 years and I'm incredibly optimistic that we're going to make a lot of progress on cancers. Not all of them, but on many of them over the next decade, because right. we've really started turning the corner. What about cardiovascular? Are we making progress there? We've made a lot of progress. I mean, the amount of death from cardiovascular disease has declined dramatically, uh, partly both at the population level, but also, you know, if you had a heart attack 30 years ago, uh, that was close to a death sentence, no longer. I mean, most people now survive their heart attack and a vast majority of them go on to live kind of active, uh, healthy lives. So um, we have really made massive progress on cardiovascular disease. I think that will continue uh, we're moving into much more genetic editing and those kinds of approaches to, to people at really high risk. Uh, therapies will continue to get better. So I expect cardiovascular disease will also continue to be an area where we make a lot of progress. Now, you teach, uh, obviously, students. Uh, students seem to be using a lot of uh, recreational drugs or whatever you want to call it. Is marijuana uns uh, unsafe or is marijuana actually medicinally good for you? Uh so I don't know is the short answer. I, uh, I have, uh, so first of all, from a policy point of view, I certainly believe in decriminalizing marijuana. I don't, I don't think we should be putting people in jail for having small amounts of marijuana. Um, but that said, uh, I've also not been willing to jump on the bandwagon of marijuana should be you know, ubiquitous and, and easy to get. Uh, because I do think it has it clearly has some deleterious effects, you know, because of the substance that it is, we just haven't done the studies uh, that we really need in a small proportion of people, very small, it clearly has medicinal benefits. So right. people with cancer on chemo and, and people with advanced HIV, we've seen that. Unfortunately, that category has gotten broader and broader. And now we're using medicinal marijuana for all sorts of things. I want to be data driven on this and I want to see much more data on this. So if you're the Dean of the, uh, 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 the, the, global, the, the Global Health Institute of Harvard and you're running that and you go to a party and you see somebody overweight or they're drinking too much or they're smoking, do you go up and say, look, you shouldn't be doing that or you just kind of mind your own business? Well, it just depends on if I ever want to be invited back to that party or not, is I, I guess the way I think about it. Um, but in general, I feel like uh, people know what the right answers are. Now, when I, I, when I practice and I still practice at the uh, at the VA in Boston, when I have a patient that I see, let's say who's coming for a heart attack or it's coming for a, a problem and they're smoking or they're overweight, I do talk to them because that to me is a clinical moment and I have a clinical role. You know, if you're at a party and, and you're overweight, uh, you know, it's not clear to me that you need me to tell you that you're overweight and you need to lose weight. Okay, final question, Dr. Zha. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, in, in terms of um, uh, you're turning 50. You're going to be, you're 49. You're going to be 50. Are you worried about turning 50 and you're going to you know, downward slope or you think you're going to be healthier when you're 50? Uh, I'm not excessively worried, or maybe I wasn't until you asked that question, David. Um, I hadn't been thinking that much about my own uh, decline, but I suppose uh, it's inevitable in all of us. So I, I guess I've been pretty optimistic that the 50s will treat me okay. Um, and in the short run, I'm just really focused on getting us and all the, this country through COVID. But, uh, but you raise an important point, and maybe I need to reflect a bit more. All right. On my future. Thanks very much for everything you're doing and educating people, and congratulations on your new position at Brown. Thank you so much for having me on.